Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Plus, the government here is really busy this morning to deliver this to one who hasn't really been able to be able to do it. Let's just please go. We are back. Which can offer in our We rejoice that we can join together in the worship of the Lord. May this time together be the beginning of corporate prayers of praise, thanksgiving, and decision, strengthen us to the time to be made in our community. Shout to the Lord. You're not, you're not hearing? Yeah. 
Lord Jesus Christ, you have shown us the judgment of the Lord and the Lord, the genuine love of the Lord and the Lord, both of us are the Lord and the Lord. Above all, we have created the love of the Lord and the Lord, hope of all the Lord and the Lord, and the Lord and the Lord. We have Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen us all in the knowledge that when our love has its source in you, it is indestructible by outward circumstances and influences. Realign our lives and our hearts to your love, so that faith, hope and love dwell within us and our lives testify that the greatest of your gifts to us is truly the gift of love. Amen. Our assurance of forgiveness. God's righteousness, which rescues and saves us, has been revealed in Jesus. For God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. Therefore, I declare to you, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks. Thanks. Our children's hymn, number 373, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know.
Connecting with our reformed faith, let us repeat our statement of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others. We seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. We eagerly listen for a word from you, Lord Jesus Christ, to help us in our daily life and to equip us for the mission to which you have called us. Our hymn of illumination, your word of God awoke the uncreated. Will the readers come up please?
prayer for illumination. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Red Word, the Holy Scriptures. The Old Testament readings from Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. Before you were formed in the womb, I set you apart. The Lord said to me, I choose you before I gave you life, and before you were born, I selected you to be a prophet to the nations. I answered, Sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say that you are too young, but go to the people I sent you to and tell them everything I command you to say. Do not be afraid of them, for I will be with you to protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. The Lord stretched out his hand, touched my lips, and giving you the words you must speak. Today, I give you authority over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 71, verses 1 to 6. God is our fortress and sheltering rock. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your air to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge, to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of those who are evil and cruel. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From the birth that I died on you, from the mother's womb, I will ever praise you. Glory. A reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. Love is patient and kind. There are gifts of speaking in strange tongues, 
for they will cease. There is knowledge, but it will pass. For gifts of knowledge and of inspired messages are only partial. But when what is spoken comes, then what is partial will disappear. When I was a child, my speech, feelings, and thinking were all those of a child. Now that I am a man, I have no more use for childish things. What we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. Meanwhile, these three will be faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Chapter 4, verses 21 to 30. Jesus is driven out of Nazareth. As he said to them, this passage of scripture has come true today. As you heard it being read, they were all well impressed with him and marveled at the eloquent words that he spoke. They said, Isn't he the son of Joseph? He said to them, I am sure that you will you record this proverb to me, Doctor. Heal yourself. You will also tell me to do here in my hometown the same things you heard were done in Pepper. I tell you this, Jesus added, prophets are never welcome in their hometown. Listen to me. It is true that there were many widows in Israel during the time of Elijah when they were no rain. For three and a half years, and a severe famine spread throughout the whole land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to anyone in Israel, but only to a widow living in Zephyr in the territory of Sidon. And there were many people suffering from dread skin disease who lived in Israel during the time of the prophet in Malaysia. Yet, not one of them was healed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were filled with anger. They rose up, dragged Jesus out of town, and took him to the top of the hill on which their temple was built. They meant to throw him over the cliff. But he walked through the middle of the crowd and went his way. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And now we'll enjoy some special music from Richard.
Good, mo Good morning. It's a watchword that I live by. The Lord provides. The Lord always provides. Um, can somebody just take this from me? I think I touched it unconsciously, thinking it was my phone and I need to open. So, we're going to He 
bore the pain of destruction of manuscripts by King Jehoiakim, false accusations of treason, forced exile to Egypt, imprisonment, persecution, and an unfruitful search for just one righteous person. These accounts make the book of Jeremiah as, as exhilarating as it is inspiring. Like many ministers of the gospel, I have been wrestling with this passage. This passage describes how God calls the prophet of Jeremiah. Reading the book of Jeremiah is like traveling over the speed of the divine throughout Grenada. However, when doing a deep study of it, we find several truths. God built Jeremiah into a family that had a history of religious service. Jeremiah's father was a man named Hilkiah, Jeremiah 1. Being a member of the clergy class in the city of Anathoth, Jeremiah 1, 1, 6, 2, 6, scholars believe that Hilkiah trained Jeremiah from an early age to follow in his footsteps. They lived about three miles north of the city of Jerusalem, and it was probably a safe place to be and to serve God. However, even before Jeremiah began to settle in this quiet outpost, God disrupted his life. As we look at the text, the first issue that we notice is one, divine confrontation. The text says, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, and I quote, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you to a prophet. I appointed you a prophet to the nations, end of quote. And so we see the divinity in conversation with humanity. It happens all the time. Unfortunately, regardless of how wealthy or destitute we are, none of us can run from a confrontation with God. God called many of the Old Testament prophets in a very similar way. They were living their lives of fun, frolic, and fantasy, sometimes free of all of these issues of faithfulness, justice, and mercy. And God simply disrupted their lives. As we read the text, we notice that Jeremiah, as many of us, responds to this divine confrontation through objection. Therefore, the second issue we notice is this, human objection. An objection is often the response to a divine confrontation. Jeremiah speaking said, I quote, Ah, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Jeremiah neither seeks nor welcomes this divine task. Citing his young age, he objects to this holy disruption. And I wonder at times that our objection, and I wonder if at times that our objection, God says, so you forgot that I formed you. I knew you since you were in your mother's womb. It was I who allowed you to grow and become who you are now. Your excuses are lame and without logic. God never allows Jeremiah's youth to stand in the way of sending a message that the people of Israel need to hear. And God will never allow your age or stage in life to stand in the way of sending a message that the people of God need to hear. God makes Jeremiah's objection with this confirmation. And I quote, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord, end of quote. 
Instead of God listening to Jeremiah, God goes on, detracts his objection, and gives him three a divine commission. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, and I quote, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plow. And, and Jeremiah is woefully aware of the wicked lifestyle of people. And now he has to become a social justice prophet and speak out. This family of priests had long been opposed to the ostentatious self indulgence of the Davidic cult. Thus, Jeremiah was a product and representative of theology grounded in the hostility to the Davidic establishment that is, that is both very old and very deep. With this backdrop, it seems likely that Jeremiah's call to ministry was a call to make public what he already felt in his heart. And God called this seemingly insignificant small boy to do this significantly mammoth task. And as he looks at his seemingly insignificant self, I can only imagine God supernaturally saying to Jeremiah, Oh, Jeremiah, I am always seeking people, sometimes young, other times not so young, for my divine work. And today, God is calling us regardless of where we are and who we are. Luke 4, 21 to 30. In the Gospel of Luke, we notice Jesus at the tender age of 12 and comes to the divine for his public ministry. And after, after he reads the scroll in the temple, Jesus begins to say, I quote, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And of course, he reminds them, I quote, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. And of course, and like Jeremiah, he began to speak the truth. And when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might pull him off the cliff. As he passed through the midst of them, and went on to say. As Walter Brueggemann in the Prophetic Imagination, 1975, has explained, it was the task of Jeremiah and Jesus, and it remains the task of all in the prophetic ministry to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and a perception which is alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture in which believers find themselves. The key word in this job description of the prophet is alternative. The alternative consciousness and perception that the prophet evokes are not rooted in social theory or in righteous indignation or altruism, but in the genuine alternative that Yahweh is. In other words, prophets are not simply investigative reporters who root out social inequalities and injustices and castigate their perpetrators. Rather, prophets arouse within their listeners an alternative consciousness, which in turn perceives, understands, appreciates, and evaluates reality according to the will, word, and wisdom of God. The church is a prophetic voice of today. How willing are we for God to disrupt our lives too? And your servant. Mm -hmm. I will just close with this thought of mine. Mm -hmm. whenever, whenever I leave, like, for some reason, it's always a humble experience for me. When I fly, I'm humble. When I'm on a boat, I'm humble. About a week ago, I did a little bit of sailing. Some of you do that all the time. And every time I go out, 
away from land and remind me of how insignificant I am in the in the vastness of God's majesty. When I read the sermon today, that picture came back to me, to me being out there, away from the things that distract us on land, buildings and wealth and money and success, according to the world. And you know, you just you look at you look at it from a distance and you're thinking how big here is and how small there is. And people fight daily for boundaries and go through all sorts of legal battles, family and, and strangers over, you know, temporal things. Missing the mark, missing the mark of the true meaning of our lives. Let us like the prophet Jeremiah this morning. Not let the daily come drum and the daily distractions of the large buildings in which we find ourselves and the successful people who surround us, but successful according to the worldly standards. Often. Let us not be distracted by the meaningless and let us instead be encouraged by the richness that the experience of Jesus Christ is and can bring to our lives. Having an experience with Christ compares to nothing else. And those of you who have that experience can be in your family. It compares to nothing else and no one else. We, as Christians, as part of the body of Christ, are challenged this morning to bear witness and share with others that alternative consciousness that Christ is. We're supposed to be living out what Christ is. Witnessing to others what Christ is. Are others seeing Christ in us? Are they turned on by what they see? Are they turned on by what they see? Let's ask ourselves these questions today. I'll close with prayer. Eternal God, we thank you this morning for your word. You knew that Ronnie was not going to be well this weekend, but you allowed him to be well enough to prepare this sermon because this is the word you wanted us to receive today. So even as we pray about the sermon, we pray that you would touch him in a special way, that your healing hand will rest upon him, that you, you will restore him to perfect health, as soon as possible. God, we thank you for your word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you for your word, which is supposed to wake up the dead in us, make us conscious, make us aware of where we're going on track. Through your power, through your mercy, through your grace, you have allowed us to fall, but you, you, you ask us to come back to you the contrary heart for everything we before. So God, this morning we come before you confessing wrongs that we've done. We come before you confessing things that we failed to do, things that we may have said that may have displeased you. We ask for your forgiveness. Let your word so pass us so that you will remove the carnality that's in us and replace it with your divine power and spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name.
The offering baskets are at the back of the church. If you have not already placed your offering, you may do so at the end of the service. Gracious God, your love for us is revealed in the gifts of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You call us to make these gifts evident in our lives. Receive and bless this offering as a symbol of our thanksgiving and as a sign of our commitment to be prophetic witnesses of your love and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We take our prayers to the Father, who is always willing to hear us, through Christ, our High Priest and Mediator, in the power of the Holy Spirit, our Enabler and Guide. Family updates. Are there any family updates? Birthdays, anniversaries, sad news. you all here? Yes. Thank you. That's it? No good news? <laughs> all right. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, you came to earth as Jesus Christ to show us how to love one another. Your constant love for us, even when we don't deserve it, is so evident. Father, forgive us when our actions display lack of love. We give thanks to you, Father, for the breath of air, all the things we take for granted, the sunshine, the rain, the cool breezes, the roof over our heads at night, food to eat and family and friends. We lift up those who are not as fortunate those who are ill. We remember Serana and Lin Luin, Lin Luin, and anyone else that you know personally. The elderly who can no longer worship with us in person. We pray this morning for Enid who has to rest her legs again. We pray for the nation's children who need to be at school. Keep them safe and at school, Lord. These are trying times, Lord, but we know you are always with us. Amen. Let us sing the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Go having heard your word to us to make a difference in our communities and the world. Our bidding him, O oh God, our help in ages past.
Be seated. If through the fellowship, the liturgy, the hymns, the reading of scripture, the special music or the sermon, God has spoken to you and you desire to make a profession of faith, recommitment of life, become a member of this congregation, to make a pledge or just to talk, please contact the minister to arrange an appointment. Announcements. Bible study occurs every Thursday at 5 p.m. at the Kirk. The topic is how we got our Bible. Uh, we won't have Bible study for the next two weeks until Reverend James is back with us. Rebuilding fund collections on the fourth Sunday of every month. Annual congregation meeting will be on Saturday, February the 19th from 4 to 6 p.m. Elder Training Retreat on March the 19th and the formal opening of the Kirk is scheduled for May 19th. Are there any other announcements? No, will everyone have a, a beautiful week coming? Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me.